Are you ready? Stand by. Welcome to the Three Gun Show, brought to you by Armalite. This is episode 147, and I am your host, Dave Hartman. My guests this week are Kansas City Three Gunners, Corinne Moser and Dylan Easley, and we discuss a very important topic, a practical guide to shooter's etiquette. Before we get into the interview, a couple things. First, if you are going to the Rockcastle Pro-Am, look for me in the Armalite Nexus booth on the downtimes. Rumor has it there will be some great deals, so don't miss out. Second, I've mentioned a few times that I started a Patreon account for the show. Patreon is a service that allows you as an individual to support me as a creator monetarily without the need for an intermediary like a network or something like that. If you choose to support the show using Patreon, there are multiple levels starting at $1, each with their own reward, and you can see those rewards at patreon.com slash three gun show. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N. One of those levels is a private Facebook group. Another gets you access to match recons and bonus content. And there are other great rewards at other levels as well. These match recon episodes will be available through Patreon exclusively for the first 90 days for supporters of the three gun show. And uh, there are many of them out there already, but if you can't support right now for whatever reason, no problem. I totally understand They they will be available to you just a little bit later than usual. If you do choose to support the Three Gun Show using Patreon, you can do so at patreon.com slash three gun show. And uh, big thanks to all of you that have already signed up. It really means a lot to me. So thank you for that. Now on to this week's show. Dylan, Corinne, and I have a great topic for you. And it is definitely something that we as shooters don't cover with new shooters very often, but we, we expect it from all of our peers. Match etiquette is a topic that we should all take very seriously And as you'll hear in this interview, it starts before we even hit the range and continues long afterward. Show notes can be found at threegunshow.com slash episode 147. Now enjoy this one with Dylan Easley and Corinne Moser. Corinne, Dylan, welcome to the Three Gun Show. Hey. Glad to be here. It's good to have you both back. And uh, you guys are actually in the same room in, uh, in Missouri, right? Actually at my office in Kansas City. Yep. He gave me an adjustment 30 minutes ago, so I needed it. Nice. And now you have to uh, pay back with a uh, interview. Is that what the deal is? Um, well, I, it was his idea, but then I think I volunteered to be part of it or <laughs> something like that. It was hot outside. I don't quite remember how it went how exactly. <laughs> it went. Always bring up ideas when it's 102. Yeah. Always make really important decisions when your brain is fried from the heat. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. No important decisions when you're uh, when you're dehydrated, hungover, which I guess are one and the same thing, or sleepy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, or so, shop when you're hungry. So, Corinne, uh, yeah, so Corinne, you mentioned that you uh, you got an adjustment. So recently, you uh, had been having problems with uh, one of your hands having twitching or something like that. What's going on? Oh, I had just noticed that my right thumb was was twitchy. I mean, and, you know, so I took a little video of it and put it on social media kind of as a joke, like, hey, what's going on? Am I dying? What is this? What does this mean? Uh, You know, people were really nice, gave me some suggestions. And I came to see Dylan to kind of get my neck worked on, maybe my wrist, kind of figure out my shoulder, maybe what was going on. And it's 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 a lot better. Um, Well, it's twitching now. I think (laughs) I work out a lot. (laughs) So I I must have something to do with that, but um, maybe I drink too much water. Maybe I'm flushing out vitamins and minerals that I need. I'm still working on it, but it it doesn't affect my shooting, so it's all right. Then it doesn't really matter. Well, I I still think it's cancer. It's oh well, that got deep and dark really quick. (laughs) I was pretty sure you were dying, and uh, that was my (laughs) opinion. And then I went back and revisited later, and everyone is actually trying to help. I'm like, oh, we weren't supposed to joke around about this. Yeah, no, no. People had all sorts of suggestions, actually. I actually started taking magnesium, and I was already taking potassium, so I've noticed an improvement, but also um, Dr. Dylan helped me out a little bit, too, so and that was that was right before the Trigicon mm-hmm. team event that yeah. then I, I took a picture and posted with him holding a spine 
saying, hey, is it a is it is it a good idea to get an adjustment from a guy that you're going to compete against in less than a week? <laughs> And uh, snafu on my part, I didn't actually get to attend the match, but um, so who knows what he would have sabotaged, how he would have sabotaged me, but I doubt he would have. It didn't hurt us. <laughs> no. We did, we did okay no, you match. still won. Yeah. It helps when you have an 18-year-old kid who can carry you for, 18, or for eight stages. Yeah, that's always nice, right? Yeah, little Tim Yackley's got a strong back to carry a 240-pound man for eight stages. <laughs> Yeah, if you're going to pick a teammate, at least pick one that's so much better than you that you uh, you don't have to yeah. try so hard. Yeah, between him and Gil, it was like, man, just try not to be the anchor. So, How'd that work out for you? Uh, we ended up winning the match by 3.2 seconds out of almost 400. Nice. So it, it came out good for us. Very cool. Well, you guys uh, just had a, another match last week and one that you were involved with uh, intimately, the Shoot for the Gold three-gun charity match for Special Olympics Kansas. How did the, how did the match go? It sounds like it was a, a roasting hot day, but you guys made, made it through. It was actually a day and a half. Um, we had Brian Corey come up and set up and design almost all the stages. I got to design stage eight at the very end. Uh, but we also had him building and maintaining, so we spent – I know I was out there for 11 hours on Friday. I believe Corinne and her husband and Brian were out there Thursday, Thursday as well. Thursday and Friday, yeah, Thursday and Friday. Um, so a lot of hours were put in to build it. The local Overland Park Police Department, uh, they provided all the range officers, mm -hmm. so all volunteers on that front. Um, it was hot, like 102, 104 plus heat index. Mm -hmm. So Costco donated a bunch of, a um, bunch of like 2,000 water bottles to keep everybody hydrated. Uh, Saturday went actually ahead of schedule we were that's the first so, time i've ever been to a match where we were in the in ahead of schedule the entire time which was good because like dylan said it, it was it was 102 103 um and i think every you know the, but that just speaks to the brilliance of brian Corey's design is you know everything every stage was a 90 second part time which helped things move along but he knew exactly which stages uh, we're going to create a bottleneck and or which ones were going to go fast. And so it, it's, it really had mostly to do with Brian's stage planning and design that everything went so smoothly because as long as the shooters, you know, participated, were on the ball, um, didn't, didn't, um, you know, you know, uh, take their time too much, everything ran really smoothly. And not only that, ahead of schedule. So, uh, you know, Lots of props to Brian Corey because it, it was his genius, really, that helped us move so quickly. Yeah, he had the squad matrix, the time on the stages, everything down perfect. We had a, a designed bottleneck on stage eight with a long travel time going to stage one, a fast stage on stage one with virtually no reset, then a little bit of travel time from one to two, and then it was a fast stage to get you back rolling again, and it, it was flawless. So it was hard to argue that, uh, you know, when you've got pretty much 100 shooters rolling through in a day and a half through eight stages, you know, for a charity event, that it went smooth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel you like... You can't control the weather. Yeah. Yeah, no kidding. That's uh, that's one thing I've learned over the <laughs> couple of years of, of hitting major matches is the uh, the weather will screw you every time. But the uh, the stage well, flow is something that's often overlooked. Really. So if I remember, right, Brian Corey mentioned to you and said that um, that the reason why we didn't have rain during the match was because you weren't there. Yes. That if you would have been there, instead of them rebuilding stages Sunday morning after the storm, uh, we would have been shooting in the storm. So uh, Brian <laughs> said a thank you for, uh, for for staying out in Colorado. Yeah. Hey, you're welcome. So I actually shot a uh, local three-gun match on uh, Saturday, and when I showed up, everyone was like, uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, didn't rain, so it must only be when there's a large amount of money involved. Exactly. It wasn't a major match, so it's not your fault. Yeah. Although, did you guys see how much rain we got at the uh, Colorado Three Gun Championship? That was like the week before your match. It was absolutely insane. Well, see, I was in Pennsylvania for the Trichicon Three Man Three Gun, so that would make sense because we had perfect weather all day, and the match you were at got flooded. So, yeah. Thank you for not going to Trichicon. Yeah, yeah no, I no think problem. Dave, I think you're not invited to our match next year. I think you're just gonna go find something else to shoot because yeah, we don't like I said we had the heat and we had a I think it was like a microburst on Saturday night 
Yeah. So we had Carl with Gunfighter Targets who actually stayed on property in his trailer call us at 5.30 in the morning on Sunday morning saying, um, guys, we've got stages down, there's trees everywhere, and there's no power. And we had porta-potties that were shoved, you know. It was 40, 40 yards. 40 yards or so. I mean, it was a <laughs> it was a serious storm. But we we managed to still get our first shots at 9 o'clock. Yeah, we, we started on time yeah. on Sunday morning. And That's then we insane. were done shooting by, I believe, noon. That's insane. Well, so yeah, we, so I, I've been saying that uh, that I'm going to contract with uh, local farmers to bring the rain to them. But maybe yeah. maybe I just uh, threatened to come to a match and then take a ransom payment to stay away and actually give nice weather to that match. You would probably be uh, making a pretty penny doing that. <laughs> Yeah, I'm I'm uh I'm almost perfect for the year for uh for crappy weather it matches and uh at, at the Colorado Three Gun Championship we had a like a, a barrel that was sitting in front of a couple targets to obscure one of them with an open top. Uh, the next day I went over to make sure it hadn't moved and I kind of smacked it and it didn't move at all and I looked in it and there's like four inches of water in this thing and I'm not lying like we had you know the two and three quarter inch shotgun shells that had been uh, expended so now they're like three inches long or maybe a little bit longer and those were sitting um, facing up and just completely full of water. We took all that in like an hour and a half. Wow. Yeah, there's a few farmers around here that would love to have you make a trip. Yeah. Yeah, tell them to put a three-gun match in their field, and I'll, I'll come out and shoot it. It'll be great. <laughs> well, uh, so I'm, I'm glad, you're, uh, glad your match went off and uh, went off you know, without any sort of uh, uh, delays or anything. Went off early. Um, our topic that we're here to talk about is kind of match related. And I think the two of you, because of your experience in putting on matches and shooting matches have like a unique perspective on it. So we're here to talk about how to be a good squad mate, how to, how to be a good shooter, how to uh, treat each other on the range. And this, uh, this seems like kind of intuitive, like maybe grade school stuff, but it's, uh, it's not something that we hear talked about a lot. And there's very little rules to, uh, to cover this in, uh, in most rule sets. So, so let's get started. Like, how how do we uh, how do we be a good squad mate? Does it start when when we uh, pull our guns out of the truck or what? Well, um, before before we even get to that, what you said was true. It's not. It seems like it should be intuitive, but you don't learn how to be a good squad mate uh, ex until you're actually at a match and you're watching other people or you have whoever's mentoring you, making suggestions and. And so it is a learning process. It needs to be said that it is a learning process and you're going to you're going to do the wrong things and you're not going to be a good squad mate all the time until you can pick up on these things. Um, like when I go, you know, bowling, you know, there are little etiquette things like you don't bowl right next to a person who's bowling. You wait for them to go first. Well, you don't realize that until somebody mentions it to you and you realize you've been doing it wrong. So, um, you know, Dylan has some ideas about how to how to be a good squad mate, but it just yeah. out there, it, it has to be learned. So if someone comes up and a friend or whoever corrects you on something that you were doing, um, they're just trying to help you learn. They're just trying to help you learn. So. That That's a great point. And I have an embarrassing story to tell about myself about something that you don't know unless you do it, right? So uh, the first time I flew on an airplane was when I was 25. And um, when I, we were walking down the line, the guy in front of me, like, stopped, put his bag up, and I just kind of slipped behind him. And he goes, excuse me. I was like, excuse me. And I didn't realize, like, oh, you're supposed to stop and wait for him to put his bag in the overhead compartment and then proceed. And slipping around him is, like, somehow offensive or whatever as, yeah. uh, as you're getting on the plane. I was like, oh, well, how would I know that? Although I am an adult, and clearly <laughs> I should have known that. But, the, uh, but yeah, you're right, Corinne. It's, it is one of those things where we just take for granted the things that we know. Uh, because we, you know, we've been shooting and stuff like that. So uh, it's something that's rarely covered in in uh, new shooters meetings. Like when you go to a uh, a local match, they'll have like a hey, here's your 180. Don't shoot this target from here. That kind of stuff. But rarely do they cover, um, you know, resetting and how to be a good squad mate and stuff like that. One of the people I see doing it best is uh, Jeremy Moore in Texas. You know, in every stage brief, it says uh, resetting is mandatory, shooting is optional. Hmm. Yeah, actually, Jeremy does a lot of things that are it should be made an example of. He, yes. he does really well with that. That's his match down there, uh, the Vortex Shooter Source match. We finished it up last year, and before we finished the match, it was this. We will be back at this match, and uh, and it was fantastic this year too. And it was on the schedule for next year before we finished this year. So yeah, he does it really well. Kind of like you mentioned, like being on the airplane. Uh, 
one of the first things I noticed is, you know, my first USPSA match was a year and a half after starting three guys. Well, in USPSA, there's some etiquette things that I didn't know them until somebody was mad at me. And, <laughs> and for the most part, when you're walking stages, whether you're walking them the day before or you're walking them in your five minute walkthrough, uh, I would walk through the stage and then I would turn right around and I'd walk right back up. And then, of course, you know, local shooter Matt Hopkins kind of barks up and goes, hey, exit out the back. I'm going, uh, yeah, I know the exit is in the back, you know, and uh, I'm like, what the heck is this guy talking about? So then I go through it on my first stage. I'm used to shooting three gun. I walk over to the first target. It's got two holes in it. And I paste them. Uh, yes. That in USPSA, you get barred. That's that's actually in the rule set. Um, but you go through and all of a sudden, like, yeah, you own that target. I'm like, I don't want this target. It's already been shot. I'm not taking it home. And they're trying <laughs> to explain to me that, hey, you screwed up. Uh, so that guy had to get a reshoot because mm. I didn't really know how things went in USPSA. So the hard part is unless you've got a mentor showing you or you have some instruction guide somewhere else saying, hey, here's the etiquette of what you do and what you don't do, you're typically not going to find out until somebody yells at you. And then depending upon how well you take it, that may or may not go too well. A lot of it has to do with how you take it because, um, well, also, and, and the mentor, um, I think a lot in this sport, and whether it's USPSA, uh, three-gun nation, multi-gun, whatever, uh, so much of the how smoothly the match runs or how how well it goes or how well how good your shooting experience is has to do with um you know relying on more experienced shooters to give you these tips to teach you as as it goes it may or may not be included in the stage brief uh, like you mentioned jeremy has it in every single st stage brief but those are the types of things that you want you want to tell people, you know, the match depends on you, it depends on your etiquette, it depends on your resetting abilities, it depends on whether you're ready to shoot when it's your time to shoot. It depends on if you're helping the people around you, if you're being polite to the ROs, if you're being respectful. Um, but, uh, you know, you, you really do need to rely on the more experienced shooters, and hopefully they're setting a good example. Hopefully they are doing the right things. Because so. we know some don't. Most, what? the majority do, but there are some that don't always set the best example. It's true. And uh, the funny part is, is kind of like we talked about in the pre-show, if you look at it from a perspective of your average shooter, then the perspective of a sponsored shooter, then the perspective of the range officer and match admin. So if I'm looking at it from a match director standpoint, my viewpoint on it uh, as a shooter now is a little different because I see how it affects the match mm -hmm. when you're not doing things that are you know, sound etiquette and you're, you're going through and you're doing things that are, you know, lazy or you're doing things that arguably what I would probably argue later is cheating, uh, which we'll kind of get into a little bit more. Yeah. Um, you know, if I'm the match director and I see an issue that somebody may not complete the match, they may be decouped from the match or what I'm going to call on sportsman like conduct. Uh, and it's, it's going to make a few people a little upset to hear it, but it is what it is. Uh, as a shooter, when I see that and I'm out there, my, work ethic and the way that I respond in the range and act on the range is probably going to be a little bit different. And that's partially molded by a little experience in running a match and working matches. Because I've rode in the past several times and then worked several matches. And uh, your viewpoint changes on things a little bit. If you've got somebody out there who just goes to the system and is just a customer, they've got to understand the etiquette side of it that, yes, you are a customer. Um, you should be able to complain about some things with the matches. How you do that will usually determine how the response comes back to you, if that makes sense. Because uh, I've made mistakes with that in the past, and I've done it the correct way in the past. And the correct way resulted in fantastic changes to a match. The, uh, the negative side, when it came time to look at sponsors, I had people coming across saying, you're a problem shooter. You're, you're a person who's going to be an issue at the match. And we're afraid that's going to affect the reputation. So um, having good etiquette on the range before, during, and after the stage, and even after the match is going to be kind of a key for you. So let's, uh, let, let's talk about that, Dylan. You can't just, like, toss that out there that you're a problem child and then uh, not address it. So give us, uh, you know, get into as much detail as you want to and uh, okay. kind of give us a little bit of background so, on, so on what the situation to, uh, was. Not to name any particular match or... Uh, staff or anything, but several years ago there was a match that I attended that the uh, the ethical boundaries I think were crossed in several aspects. There were there were things that supposedly were missing from the prize table. There were people walking prizes 
and a table that were physically unable to at any other match across the country. Uh, things were rumored to be happening during the match, things that I personally witnessed during the match that you go through and like, that's, that's questionable. Bare minimum, the stage should be thrown out if that happened and the things that I saw um, should have happened, the things that ROs are literally telling you during the match. And so I, I kind of crossed a, crossed a boundary in my opinion. Uh, I made some poor judgment, and I went straight to what was then probably the most popular place to go was the Brian Enos Forum, and I brought it up. And when it came across, I finally went through and said, hey, if nobody's going to openly say it, here's what the accusations are. Refute them. Uh, the match ended up dying. Uh, it went away, and which, which has probably been a good thing for the sport on its own, and it probably would have died on its own without my help. The problem was I created a name for myself, at the time, I looked at it as I paid for the match. I shot the match. Um, I'm a customer of the match, and I wasn't a happy customer. And uh, unfortunately, it had some negative effects when I started looking at sponsorship. And I would believe that my image now is 180 degrees away from that. But it was a it was an experience that was kind of a hard learned, which is usually how I learn lessons in life. <laughs> uh, on the flip side of that, uh, another one which I will name the match, and I will name the match director was uh, Fallen Brethren several years ago. The match director had targets that were painted black, and they, depending upon how the sun moved, they would end up in a shadow. And so we talked to him ahead of time, like, you know, there's, you've got to do something to where it's equitable for the shooters from stage to stage. And when I, when I sent an email directly to Jim Smith, the match director, uh, his response back to me was, thank you for getting back with me. Thank you for getting back with me privately not bashing the match stuff like that and when he turned around he made changes to the match the next year we went it was fantastic uh we finished the match and we get ready to go to the prize table and jim stands up front and has five or six of us stand up calls us out by name and says hey by the way if you like the changes to the matches these are the people to thank uh, these people contacted me privately we made those changes and i know some of the changes that we recommend is not everybody absolutely loves them but that's where you started seeing the first uh, corrugated plastic on the back of a target to where the corrugated plastic was orange or yellow or yeah. bright green neon colors. And then you didn't have to paint the long range targets every time. And they were easy to find regardless if you shot early in the day or late in the day. And uh, universally, they went over pretty well. And that was the correct way to do it in approaching that problem. So it, it was... Um, it, it was it was a good experience in that. It was a hard learned experience for me, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so uh, thank you for uh, for clearing that up and for giving us a little bit of background on that. I think that also gives uh, you know kind of a a good perspective on um, where you're coming from in in our talk here as well. So so let's uh, let's let's get right into it then. So when when uh, when you're a, a shooter no matter what your experience, what, what kind of person should you be on the range? Like what are some things that, that you want to make sure you do and do not do? I think you have to find a balance between you're there to compete. So it, it's very much about, it's about you at a, to a certain point because you've got your plan, your gear, you've got to make sure that you're ready to shoot, um, you know, mentally and physically. Um, but then you also have to have this side where you're part of a team, you're part of a squad um, and you're part, uh, bigger than that, of an entire match. And you're also a visitor in somebody else's home. You know, you, this is probably not your home range. Even if it is, you need to be respectful of the range rules, of maybe some other patrons that are the range that are not part of your match. Um, so I think when you go and you're a shooter, uh, you need to be active. You need to be actively um, you know, listening to the ROs. You need to be actively um, participating as a resetter. You need to be ready to shoot when it's your time to shoot. You need to be ready so that when the RO has cleared all of the guns and he is following the last resetter back to whatever starting point you're at, you're there waiting for him or her uh, with your guns ready to go. You've listened to the order in which they're going to stage the guns, if that's going to be a thing, um, and you're ready where they need you to be because um, they don't have time. If you was talking about the ROs, they don't have time to repeat themselves if you have 13 people on the squad 13 times. They don't have time for that. Um, 
So, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's realizing it's just a respect thing. It's, you know, if, you know, so if we look at it from, uh, before the match ever starts, you know, most of us are going to show up a day in advance and walk the stages. Um, you're going to see, and, and I know, Dave, you've noticed this at matches, you're going to find that uh, most matches, the stages are fairly straightforward on about two-thirds, and then one-third of the match is going to have that, man, you've got a couple memory stages, you've got a couple stages, you can start anywhere. Well, where do you want to start? Where can you get these targets from? So if you're on those stages, you know, don't just stand in the way the whole time. Go through and interact with the people around you maybe share a couple ideas, something like that. I mean, this is the one sport where your shotgun goes down. I will hand you mine and happily watch you beat me with it. Um, so I, I don't want to go through and pretend like, you know, hey, it's not a competition. I still want to win. Uh, but, you know, having, I, I guess, being a good person on the range beforehand is, is kind of a big thing, uh, going through and the same thing right before you shoot your stage, when you're shooting your stage, when you finish how you interact with match staff, and then once you leave the match or leave the stage, everyone will look at it, there's some additional things there. Uh, but I'd say, you know, if we started at just looking at it before the match, you know, we've all been to the, the matches where we're standing there at the end of the bay trying to figure it out. Um, go, go through the aspect of, you know, you were down at the Three Gun Nation Regional in Texas last year, and there was the one big stage that none of us got to shoot, right? Yeah, yeah. There's a hundred people standing on this one bay trying to figure it out. And it was kind of cool to watch because I can be there with some of the, the top shooters that were with the Cobalt team, everything else, and go through and they're like, well, what do you think? Well, I think if I start here, I can see everything here. I only have to make my way across the range one time this way. And then they're looking at it and you're looking at it. And it's not a, you know, giving a, a tip to your buddy because these are the guys I'm going to be shooting with tomorrow. You know, I'm not trying to hide anything. Right. Well, so let's uh, let's let's uh, explore that a little bit. So we're we're in like the walkthrough. We're in pre-match mode here. One thing that that I've noticed and that I would uh, I would add to what you're talking about is uh, you're going to see ROs, the people that are going to be working the match, the people that are volunteering their to- their time. You're going to see them shooting. Stay out of their match. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they, I would even say stay off their stage. That that's exactly what I'm saying. Is uh, is it's, I've uh, I've been yeah, there multiple times. I'm sorry, Dylan. Go ahead. Well, in, interrupting them is not acceptable, and being a distraction to them is not acceptable either. You know, if if I'm an RO and I'm shooting the match, I don't want you coming over asking how many targets there are or how are you going to shoot it. And you know, I'm getting ready to shoot. Leave me alone. Yeah, one uh, thing that I've noticed a few times is. Uh, during an RO match, you'll turn around from uh, from taping targets or resetting steel, and there'll be people on the stage air gunning and with their little notebooks and stuff. It's like, dude, this is our yeah. match. Like, get the hell out of here. That's that's not that's not just for the RO match. Like you're talking about, that's during the actual main match as well. Yeah. Um. That's you know when when you have to wait on another on another squad before you can shoot that stage. Don't don't be on their bay. You know I've noticed it. It actually annoys me when I'm resetting and I turn around and there are people walking and air gunning, like you said, on my stage. I'm like, you need to wait your turn. Now, how do I know this? Because I've been guilty of it. I know that I've done it. I know that I've been that person air gunning because I, I failed to prepare appropriately for the match. Maybe I didn't get get there the day ahead. Maybe something changed. And I, I have this panic mode of, Uh, I I gotta, you know, I gotta figure this out. I gotta walk this one more time or else what the world's going to end. I don't know. You know? (laughs) So, uh, you know, stay off the stages. It's it's um, it slows them down. It's just plain rude. Uh, so it's not just for the RO. It's it's during the main match as well. I, I've been yelled at for being on a stage in the past that you go through and hey, they're resetting. Why would they even notice I'm here? And then all of a sudden you turn around and they're like, you know, they're yelling at you to clear the stage because you're focused on it. And and my wife accuses me of it. That I focus on one thing, and the rest of the world doesn't exist around me while I'm focused on it. Uh, and so. I'm focused on it. I'm looking at it, and they're like, hey, clear the stage. Next shooter's making ready, and you're going, oh, oh yeah. Now you got to run back across the stage. Well, you just screwed up that shooter. You, you know, it's kind of like icing the kicker, if you will. Uh, you, you mess with that shooter and his game plan. He's watching, waiting for you to get out of the way because you're being annoying. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, it, they're going through their aspect. Just give them their space. You can stand back and watch more most mm-hmm. times. Yeah. 
I mean, and you may remember to get off the stage before they start, or you may make a mistake like I did, like two years ago at Gen 3 Gun. I think I was trying to coach a junior shooter or something, maybe Sydney or somebody, and just a, how are you going to shoot this? I'm going to shoot like this. And there I am standing in the middle of the bay, and they're mm-hmm. behind me, and the R look, R looks at me. They're ready. He's got a shooter with their guns, and he looks at me and goes, Karen, you know better. And I'm like, you're right. I know better. I'm so, you know, it's, you, you don't pay attention for five seconds. That's all that it takes. Yeah. And, and, you know, this is serious stuff too. You, you can put yourself in a situation where you're down range and they've started the stage, you know, that could potentially happen. We've seen videos of that happening. We've um, all seen that YouTube we've video. We've all seen that YouTube yep. video, but, yeah. but that, you know, but on the other, to, to go further into that, what do you do when you do get yelled at or, you know, when I say yelled at or you get counseled or you get corrected? I think the way that you handle um, as a shooter, the way that you handle taking correction from somebody else, it may be a fellow squad member, it may be an RO, it could be the match director. I think the way that you handle that, because we're all make, we're all going to make mistakes, we've all made them, we're going to continue to make them, um, determines how you handle it determines um, the outcome. Not yes. necessarily, it's not the end of the world that you made a mistake, it, it, but it might be the end of the world about how you handle being corrected for that mistake. That's true. So what's a Corinne, give us an example of uh, like a, a correction and maybe uh, how you could take it poorly and how you could do it better. Um, I think that the, f- the very first thing that you need to do and, you know, Dylan, ch- mm-hmm. chime in at any time. You need to leave your ego at the door. Um, mm-hmm. Not easy to say to competitors because we all have a yeah. little bit of an ego, right? A lot. Um, you know, it doesn't feel good to be corrected, especially uh, in front of other people because it's going to be public, Right. Um, especially, you know, if they have to yell across the stage and get off the stage or whatever, um, you get that little childish sense of you yelled at me. I don't like you, you know, and uh, you need to just recognize it for childishness and uh, be grateful that they corrected you. And then occasionally you may get somebody who seems that they reacted to whatever you did over the top. They were inappropriate. They didn't need to scream at you that loud. They didn't need to whatever, whatever. Um, Just Take it with a grain of salt. You don't know what that, per- especially if it's an RO. There's a reason why I don't. I have not volunteered to RO because I think that's got to be one of the most frustrating, hardest jobs. It's like probably herding a bunch of cats with guns. I just, I, I could never, I could do it, but I don't want to do it because it seems very, very difficult. So if you ever come across an RO who seems like they're particularly like snippy or they yelled at you for no reason, or they didn't have to handle it that way, understand you may come across one or two grouchy ROs in a match um, after they've come across about 30 grouchy competitors yeah. or entire squads who nobody would listen to them, No, you know, nobody followed their directions. And how frustrating is that? Um, I wouldn't want to be an RO. So you need to, you know what, unless you're going to RO and step up, listen to what they're saying you know, be grateful for the advice because you're probably never going to make that mistake again. And just plain get over yourself. You know, no hurt feelings. Uh, they're just trying to help you be a better competitor. The match runs smoother. And it's probably also a safety issue. So you don't have the right to, um, you know, get upset about it if they're correcting you over a safety issue. We've all seen the, the grouchy RO. That, you know, honestly, sometimes the grouchy RO the match as a match director, if I see that, I'm going to step in like, hey, you need to take it down a notch. Keep it there, but take it down just a notch. Uh, and a lot of times, the grouchy RO is usually the one that his squad's running on time, mm-hmm. and and the shooters are doing things right, and he's probably not having to DQ anybody because when he goes through, he's going to stand there. And and so one thing with etiquette, the RO is going to go through and do a stage brief, right? He's got a written stage brief. He's going to go through. Okay, so where are you? You should be over by there or at least close enough that you can listen to everything he has to say and interact with him. And if I'm the RO, because I've RO'd in the past, uh, you know, RO actually quite a few matches in the past. If I'm going to go through the written stage brief and RO, I'm just going to stand there and nobody gets to start until everybody's paying attention. I'm going to holler out a couple of times. And if I got that one person over in the next bay loading bags, I'm going to have the whole squad turn around and look at him. And, you know, hey, you may not like it, but we're going to make you the center of attention until you know, senior snowflake comes over to hang out. Public shame. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, for the most part, I would say that, um, you know, scold in private and praise in public, you know, that was one of the, the managing things that my father told me from when he was a manager and when I got promoted in undergrad. And, uh, I would do that for the most part. But if somebody's going to sit there and disrespect the RO, then, hey, guess what? We're going to wait for you. 
you just come on over here when you're ready, sunshine. And everybody's <laughs> waiting on you. Uh, and that, that, get, that usually tells you that the person over there who's not going to come pay attention, number one, they're not respecting the RO. They're really not respecting their squad mates because their squad mates are going to be the ones that have to answer all the questions for the person who didn't pay attention. So if on this stage, you have to start with an unloaded pistol completely and you show up and the first thing they do when they say make ready is load your pistol. You just put everybody 30 seconds behind on the match because now they got to wait for you to unload it and start over. And then if you're asking questions in your, in your, uh, your make ready or your walkthrough, you're wasting your time in the walkthrough and you're also wasting your squad mates and your distraction. So your etiquette on that was pretty piss poor, for lack of a better word. So if we're looking at for that pre-stage aspect, you know, you need to make sure that you're going through and you know, kind of like we mentioned a little bit maybe that uh, it's your turn. You're the shooter on deck. You need to be standing there how that RO tells you to. If you need to be there, muzzle up both long guns in hand. That's how you're expected to be there. Uh, one of the best ones, the, the guys from Dreadnought Industries, they always RO stages down in Texas. They have the circle of shame, which is basically a hula hoop thrown on the ground. And what you're expected to do is you should be in that circle when you're the shooter on deck and you should be ready to go. I, I would love to see that expanded to every match. Yeah. The on-deck shooter needs to be in this circle, ready to go. And when that squad comes off the bay, you're ready. You come up to the line. The next on-deck shooter goes in the circle. I think it's a fantastic way to do it. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's great because you always know where you're supposed to be, and then uh, you get people like Hunter Sykes doing the shameful try to uh, try to hula hoop videos, right? Oh, it makes it even better there. <laughs> yeah. Well, so that's a that's a good point is being being ready where uh, and in the position with all your all your gear and everything when uh, when everyone comes back from resetting when the RO or the scorekeeper is looking at you or looking for you. So as as the uh, you know the on deck shooter. That's that's your responsibility. So then, when it's your turn to shoot, you shoot, all right. And then, what's your responsibility as the shooter that has just shot? Uh, so this this is this is where I've seen some uh, common mistakes. Um, the first thing you're doing is unloading and showing clear, making the range safe again. Okay, uh, not that it was unsafe when you're shooting, but we're gonna have people moving down range. So. Don't stand there and look at your targets, count the number of holes. If you finish shooting and you're done, unload, show clear, do as the range officer commands. Then once everything's done, if you've got a friend who can walk through and check targets for you, uh, as many matches they call it, you know, having somebody who will proxy for you, have them check the targets. And if somebody says, hey, there's a miss over here, uh, if I'm not the shooter, number one, I'm not touching the target, I'm going to point at the target and let them come over and look at it whether that's the actual shooter or that's the proxy, um, either way. And then you have that opportunity. Uh, if the stage didn't go as well as you pleased, um, keep in mind there are people who are coming as spectators at times. There are people who have family on the range, uh, blurting out things that probably shouldn't be said on the range. You know, Not to tell everybody they have to have a filter, but I know uh, one of the brand ambassador little Facebook groups that we've all seen um, as far as, you know, how do you act on the range to be a sponsored shooter and a brand ambassador? I would say whether you're a brand ambassador or not, whether you're a sponsored shooter or not, uh, if you're going through and you're dropping F-bombs and smashing your rifle on something, uh, we've all been through that where we've been upset. You know, you, things didn't go right, the guns malfunction, whatever it is. You know what, fake it until you make it. Go through and fake that you're okay with it. Walk back, put your stuff up, uh, go to the porta potty and, you know, Take a minute to uh, to curse in silence, if you will, then come back out and act like a respectful person, somebody who's not a you know a toddler. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, that you know I've I've had my share of uh, uh, bad stages and everything, and I highly recommend just uh, biting your tongue politely, grabbing your uh, your gear, exiting, and then going off and swearing in your head. That uh, that yeah. certainly works for me. It 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 doesn't do any good to anyone when you. You know, have like a little mini temper tantrum, no matter what it is, because if uh, if I'm like the the on deck shooter or someone who's down the line, I don't want to hear someone, you know, screaming and crying about not hitting a target or you know, this that or the other thing or a gun malfunction or anything, because it screws with everyone's game. Yeah, have you ever seen the guy who's up to bat after the guy who gets hit by a pitch, charges the mound, and punches the pitcher in the face? <laughs> that that uh, guy no. always strikes out, right? <laughs> 
pick because that guy's going up there. You, you ice the kicker. He walks up to the plate and he's like, well, what am I going to do now? The last guy punched the guy in the face. You know, <laughs> well, I'm not going to run out there. He got thrown out of the game. It, it's kind of the same concept. Don't, don't do that to your squad mates. You know, uh, I, I've, I've commonly come off the stage and it didn't go well, malfunctions or whatever it may have been, and walk over and somebody wants to say something like, you know what, just give me a minute. Yeah. Give me a minute. I go put my stuff up. I take a moment. I take a drink of water, uh, whatever I need to do. And then I come back. I'm like, oh, man, this went wrong. I'm, I'm not sure what happened, but I had a double feeder. Uh, for whatever reason, I think I need to change my shotgun mag tube spring. The shell didn't come out on the lifter, so I had to mess with it. I lost a lot of time. It's frustrating. But I'm going to go over to the car. I'm going to put a new shotgun spring in or mag tube spring or whatever it may be. But, you know, you can, you can look at somebody and say, hey, give me a minute. Yeah, absolutely. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, say, give me a minute, walk off, take your second come back and then it's time to time to be a big boy again. Absolutely. So then and I think, go ahead, I think the rule of thumb should be try not to take longer than it takes for the next shooter behind you to shoot. Um, ideally, ideally you should be ready to reset for the person who just went, depending on the length of the stage. Um, it might take you the next shooter. Um, but something that I try to do and, and sometimes I need to take a second or, or it, whatever think about things but you can think about things while you're resetting so when i come down off the stage dylan's absolutely correct you need to take care of your guns first it's not you're look you're anxious you want to know how well you did you want to know the time you need to know you want to know if there are any penalties you want to know if it's clean and if you did a good job but the really good ro's that i've seen um when i get anxious and i'm you know i'm done with my last shot and i show clear with maybe my pistol but i've got two long guns to clear too um and i go what was the time the good ones would say, we'll clear the guns first and then I'll tell you the time, you know, and that's a reminder to me going, okay, okay, okay. We've got to take care of the first things first. Let's clear the range of every, so that everybody can reset. Then I'll take a look at my time. Then I'll see if it was clean, either me or a friend. Um, and then I go back and I, I do reload my magazines real quick, which is going to help me be prepared for the next stage so that I'm not, okay, well, you know, you're doing the stage brief, but actually I've got some mags to reload, which right. is, you know, now I'm not where I'm supposed to be and I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do. Um, but I try to make it a goal for myself personally to get back to my to my cart, reload my magazines, reset my belt up, and have it not take longer than it took for the next shooter after me to shoot. Mm-hmm. Try, I try to do. Plus, um, that's, as far that's as like the, a, your at, go ahead. That's like a little post, uh, post-shoot meditation practice as well you know you've got your magazines loaded you can think about your stage and decompress while you're doing that plus you're ready and you're not hurting yourself before your next stage when you're when you're on deck next time yeah a little quiet review never hurt it is and you're you're coming off of an adrenaline dump i mean you're you're reviewing exactly what just happened and then grab some tape and then walk out there with your squad um i think that we were just we were touching on you know your attitude after something doesn't go well when you're frustrated This is a universal sports principle, no matter what sport you're playing. If you have a bad attitude, it doesn't matter how well you shot. It doesn't matter how well you played hockey. If you have a bad attitude, nobody, nobody wants to be with you. You know, you're you're taken away from the entire sport. You're, you're showing spectators that these people who play this sport are, are kind of nasty. I mean, they're, they're, they're mean and they're, you know, you don't want to be that. That's not what this sport is about because that isn't what the sport is about. People are actually really nice. Yeah. They want to do better than they do. Um, I really don't find a lot of, you know, cheaters or vindictiveness or, or cattiness. I really don't find a lot of that. And um, so, yeah, you, it, that's just universal sportsmanship. I mean, don't, don't be pouty. If you're going to pout, go do it in the porta potty. Yeah. But don't take longer than it takes the next person to shoot. <laughs> right. And yeah. especially if it's 102 degrees outside, because it's probably 130 inside that porta potty. It's going to be like a sweat lodge in there. <laughs> well, sometimes you uh, need to sweat things out. <laughs> All right. But so it, we. Uh, what I really do is I do look over to see if the RO's got the timer behind their back or out there. And if they've got the timer out there next to me, I'm, you know, I'll go through and I'll have my mag out and I'll look over and if they got the timer, you know, over close to the gun, I'll go through and I'll ask them the time. And then if, you know, if they're going like, oh, go ahead and load show clear, I'm going to move my, my hand and my gun a little to the left, try and softly pull it back. Uh, because there have been a few times where, you know, the timer happens to pick up, you know, the slide dropping down, something like that. And, th- and there's nothing wrong with walking off the stage and going, can I see what that last shot, the split was? Well, there's 10 seconds between my last shot and the last shot on the timer. Um, I, I think you got my slide closing on the, on the, uh, 
you know, show clear and holster and all that stuff. So you, know, you, you can do that. that that's the I've only concern I've had. I've never thought of that I've before. Had. I've never even thought about that. I, I've seen it happen a few times. And it, it, a lot of times it's just somebody goes to unload, show clear, you rack it out, and you look, and there's like a four-second split. At hmm. the very end, you're like, hmm, I fired six rounds, but then I fired one. After, oh, crap, I know what happened. Um, so, you know, I, I always do kind of look over at the RO, try to make eye contact with them. Uh, th that way they do know that I'm done. Uh, you know, if I'm looking at them, I'm not looking at targets. And then I'll drop my mag, make, I'll take a quick look to see where the timer is just so I'm not going to get not going to get burned by sending my slide home. But that's another thing that a buddy can do too. I know when I am walking behind a friend of mine and I'm, or anybody, I, maybe I just met them, but they handed me their camera to record for them. I always get the, the time as soon and they do. A lot of the times the RO puts it behind their back. It takes nothing to just put the camera next to the, the timer real quick. So that's, and that's another um, way that a buddy might be able to help you with that. Because now that's something else I need to worry about. So that's kind of a, an etiquette aspect. <laughs> if somebody hands you their phone and says, hey, we record on the stage. Ooh, yeah, where um, do they walk? So yep. number one, uh, stay away from the RO. Don't cross in front of the RO. Mm -mm. Uh, you know, one of the things I learned, actually Mark Roth is the one who taught me this. I went through and I, I filmed the stage for a buddy and I get to the end of it. And I just stage over. I turned it off. And he goes, no, 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 no. Always get the time. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. really? He goes, you have to always get the time. That way, if they go through, they can look at it later. They know what the time is. If something shows up different on scoring, they have the time recorded on the video, and you can always bring that up later if you have to as far as arbitration, stuff like that. But if, if somebody asks you to record for them, record. Now, here's not asking people to do this or it's a bad idea. You can have a little fun with your friends. Uh, one of my sponsors handed me his phone, and he did ask me to film a stage for him. Um, I then proceeded to hand up my phone to a friend and say, hey, record the stage for me. And he kind of looked at me like, well, why do you need to have the stage recorded on two phones? Um, I recorded his entire stage in a selfie. Uh, and I mean, in the, in the entire time, I'm... That's not even the worst thing he's ever done with no, the Bales' phone, trust it's me. Not no, even close. No. Um, but I rec re recorded every, the entire thing, the entire video as a selfie, and I think I did it to Josh Tarrant as well. Yep. Uh, which yep. I, don't, I don't know if that was politically correct enough some of the things said in the video for it to be posted on youtube uh, but he had a pretty good laugh at it and then you know i turned over once he figured out once he had a laugh i went ahead and airdropped the correct video to him so nice uh, you nice. know having fun with somebody's fine just make sure you still get their video on camera <laughs> which is one thing i have always done they at least have their video after i had a little fun with them so. well yeah i gotta say i gotta throw in my my story here then so the uh you know get the time thing is important at the end there's a, a video that, um, again, Hunter Sykes took, call names here, calling people out. Hunter Sykes took at the, uh, the Vortex Shooter Source three-gun match in uh, Crescent, and uh, he didn't get the time at the end. And right after Unload Show Clear, this tree that was in between me and the target fell down. Like I had chopped, finally chopped it down after three days of dudes shooting at it. My one round that I put into it or two, whatever it was, finally made that tree fall over and they had to go clear it. I turn around and look at Hunter and he's got like my camera in his pocket. It's like, dude, th who cares about me <laughs> shooting, man? I chopped a tree down. You got to get that part. Yeah, you miss the good stuff sometimes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, don't, right. don't get antsy on hitting that stop button. I can edit that stuff later. Yeah, exactly. So the, uh, uh, still love you, Hunter. It's okay. So the, um, we've just shot. And now we're back on the stage. What are we doing after we've stuffed our mags and we're back on the stage? You're back resetting. So we, we had a conversation about this before we started, before we linked up with you. Um, I, and I'm, I'm going to give you first off, I'm going to give you the match director standpoint. Um, in my opinion, if, if you are not resetting and everyone else is, uh, you are effectively cheating. And I know a lot of people aren't going to be real happy to hear this, but so I look at it as a golf analogy. If, if you and I both go out and we, we play around golf and we have equal ability, we have an equal skill level, an equal amount of talent, uh, we go out to the golf course and on the first three holes, you and I are we're dead even. We're, we're both at the exact same score. But the difference is uh, you're being made to walk the course and I went ahead and got a golf cart or somebody gave me a golf cart or somebody's on the golf cart and offered me a ride and they're riding me around. Um, fine, except for the fact that you and I aren't really in, an, in a fair competition at that point. You're walking two, three, four miles while playing golf. Meanwhile, somebody's driving me around while I'm getting a sip of water in between, you know, taking strokes, if you will. So 
we've had this conversation about if you have a uh, if you have a shooter and let's say it's a junior shooter and their parents are there and their parents are resetting for them, effectively you're cheating for your child. Yeah. Uh, and I know that's that's come up a couple times in the past where, hey, that kid has never touched a target the entire match or that kid's only reset on two stages and that's when the RO yelled at them, uh, but their parents are resetting. It's, you're, you're it's not a fair replacement. It's, you might be able to say, well, we're giving you two resetters when you would have had one. Well, you know, it's it's you could look at it that way. But I think what Dylan's saying is that, yeah, as you not resetting, you're, you're getting an unfair advantage because you're not getting the fatigue. You're not getting the physical and mental fatigue. And, and right. when the weather is an issue, I well, mean, we, we had a we had a shooter come up to me after Saturday at, uh, at the, the charity match with us last week. And he goes, man. On the last stage, I got all the way to the end and got to the shotgun, and all of a sudden, man, I just wasn't able to focus as hard on the targets, and I was pulling shots, and he's like, he goes, I think the heat finally got to me. So that was a person who reset every stage. He did everything, and he's getting the same wear and tear as everybody else, and guess what? He's experiencing the same thing that everyone else who was finishing up their last stage on that day is experiencing. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's, that's where you do have to hydrate everything else, but... You go, if you take somebody who their parents pull a car up there or their spouse pulls a car or their friend pulls a car up there and they sit in the air conditioning. Which I have seen. I have and, seen and that happen. happen. Yeah, uh, yeah. And the way that I look at it from the match director standpoint is that person's cheating. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I don't care if you have two people going to reset for the one person. That could have been three in, instead of one. Yeah. So if, if you bring extra people help, fantastic. You're helping your entire squad, not just yourself. But if you're the one playing the game, you're the one resetting. Yeah. Right. Period. So one thing that or I have two thoughts on that. First of all, I'm glad you brought that up, Dylan, because I, it's something I see uh, quite often. Um, the uh, first thing would be if you're a junior, if you're a female, or if you have like a Rise Armament jersey on, calling you out specifically, Dylan, just because you're an easy <laughs> example, people are going to pay attention to you and they're going to remember that, right? So if you're sitting on yep. your butt and you're not helping and you're the only junior on that squad, it's not, oh, you know, Jim Bob over here is not resetting. It's juniors don't reset. So mm-hmm. you should be yeah. cognizant of that and and know that that you're being that you're being watched because you are unique, right? There's tons of dudes that look like me. There's tons of dudes with beards out there. Yeah, I've definitely as I remember the minute I put on a jersey, and I wasn't just my my t-shirt that I was wearing to a match, but the minute I had a jersey on, um I remember being approached differently um, and friendly, right? Mm -hmm. But I specifically felt more eyes on my back, like more Mm -hmm. eyes on me. People watch you because then they're learning about, well, not just you, but how do people who wear jerseys, um, what do they do? Um, So, you know, I... I, I've counseled some other some some other people, as we all do, and I was counseled by other people, um, you know, to be a good example. Um, But also make sure that you don't give people and hear me out on this. Make sure you're not giving people more reasons not to not to like sponsored shooters. Now I say that because I've been to matches, and when when uh, people didn't know that I was was hearing, heard some disparaging things uh, said about quote sponsored shooters. Yeah. Um, I remember I was at a. a a match where we were having difficulties finishing the match at all because of because of weather like we couldn't even finish it at all well then the question was well what do we do about the prize table what do we do about this cash that was set aside for this and that and this and that and i people were saying well forget about the sponsored shooters they don't need it this or that but like it was very much an us against them which i had never encountered before and didn't realize it was there and i was like well, what have we done? What have we done to, to, to cause people to, to not like us or to have these unfavorable impressions about us? So I think, and, and maybe or maybe that's a real thing, maybe it's not, but that's my experience. But I think that you need, as a representative, not only of yourself, but as uh, um, other companies and as a person that has been, I, I feel I've been blessed, very, 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 very blessed um, with the opportunities that I have. I'm number one, I'm not gonna waste them. I'm not gonna squander them. Um, I'm going to try to share as much as I can of, you know, the excess that I have, um, you know, not only of equipment, of ammunition, of my guns, of my time, um, but, you know, I'm going to give as much as I can to my squad of myself 
And, you know, mm-hmm. it, it's the hardest to do when it's the most uncomfortable to do, when it's the weather's an issue, when you are exhausted, when you're having equipment issues. You know, just because your gun isn't working or your ammo's not working, um, you shouldn't be taking yourself out of the equation and going, okay, I'm not shooting with you guys anymore. I'm dealing with this, you know, unless it's a, a safety issue. Um, but, you know, sometimes I think you have to accept that your match is not going to be shot the way that you would like it to be shot but you're still in it with your team. You know, you're still in it with your squad and you still need to be experiencing it with them. You know, I, I got to tell you an experience that I had the very first, or maybe it was the second three gun match I ever shot. It was the first ladies Brownells three gun match. And I, I, I didn't, it was the first time I'd ever seen anybody wear a Jersey in a shooting event, you know? Mm-hmm. And I was squatted with Taryn Butler, with some of the, the, the TTI shooters and with Jesse Duff. And I was like, wow. wow, there's Jessie Duff right there, right there. And she's shooting. I got to watch her shoot. And she got DQ'd on what I believe was the very first day. Um, it, oh. it was an issue with the pistol, but she got DQ'd on the first day of three days. She reset every single time. And she stayed all three days that I could remember. Hmm. She stayed, even though she was out of the match, she stayed to help. I will never forget that example. Um, that is the ultimate example of, um, of professionalism, of what it really means to be a shooter. It's not just, I, I'm there to press the trigger. It, it, it's, a, it's the whole package. So I, I, try, to, I try to follow that example um, now. So I think one of the, well, if you go back to like USPSA as an example, one of the things you hear all the time is like, well, you know, once you get your GM card, you don't reset anymore. And so we, we've had some fun with that on the local levels. We've got a couple of GMs here in Kansas City and, and, uh, I've given more than one of them a little bit of a hard time to go through, and you know they always pick the closest piece of paper and they reset it, and, <laughs> and you go over like, oh, you know, you snap a picture and send it to them, and the uh, that like, oh, yeah, resets, this is how GM reset. The dude that resets one piece of paper and does it so well, he's like, oh, very, it's perfect. Very, okay. he, he's a grandmaster uh, close paper. Pistol yeah, paper. yeah, I, I've so. seen people do that. You know, uh, to take a step back i've seen people do that on like the ro match too where they'll be like walking the stage and like oh i'll help you guys reset and they'll reset one paster and then they'll go and yeah. start looking at positions like get out of here buddy but the uh, yeah, if yeah you're not so setting the steel and walking down and doing it then yeah you're you're more of a hindrance than a help yeah absolutely you're using so, uh, a little bit of help yeah as an as a reason to be there and, and most of the time you're better off just out of the way and you're exactly. not fooling anybody no you're not, you're not you're fooling anybody fooling everyone anybody. sees through you well, so uh, speaking of uh, GMs don't reset, I'll give you the the uh, the best example, and you all know where I'm going with this one already. Jerry Mitchellick is the hardest working dude on the range. Yeah. Oh my gosh! Yeah, and, and he'll yep. go through and finish. He'll load his mags. And next thing you know, is he's walking. he's resetting steel. He's got his gloves on. He's yep. yep. He's going to the farthest piece of steel, the farthest piece of paper, mm-hmm. everything else. I mean, yep. you'll watch kids that'll sit there and stand around, mm-hmm. not know what to do. And and part of it is they haven't really been instructed. Uh, but you'll look over and like, okay, hey, there's there is the pro shooter. If you yeah. want to talk about what is and isn't a pro? There's the pro, and look where he's doing, going, and look what he's doing. Yeah. Well, and speaking mm-hmm. of uh, juniors, I'll go back to my second point. So my second point would be, if you're those two parents out there uh, resetting for your junior, what kind of example are you setting for that child that they're just like some prima donna that mom and dad are going to come out and reset all their targets, and you're setting and, the example and, of. Uh, of you don't have to reset, that mom and dad are going to be here to do this for forever. And what kind of character are you building in a child? Well, let, let's say, for instance, you've never been to a three-gun match. You've never been to a shooting competition, but you live local. You decide to show up to the range, and your first perception, if you will, is when you walk up, um, you've got a female shooter with a jersey on, and you've got a, a junior shooter with a jersey on, and then you've got a sponsor shooter with a jersey on, and then everybody else is on there resetting, and the three of you are standing at the back. Yeah. That person who's never been there before, their first perspective is like, oh, okay, these are the celebrities. The celebrities stay back here, and the celebrities don't do anything. Everyone else caters to them. What does it look like? It looks like a bunch of prima donnas. Yes. And so when I've been to matches and you see such and such shooter that's a bit of a prima donna, stands at the back and doesn't reset, you know, everybody sees it. Everybody knows it. And, uh, what, what I've noticed in the past that's also been a bit of an issue is, you know, once you do throw a jersey on and you are sponsored, especially if you get sponsored by a few bigger companies or you have a product that somebody's interested in, uh, just kind of a little uh, pro tip, if you will, as far as being on the range, it's still your responsibility to reset, even though a bystander comes up and says, hey, I've got a question about 
this trigger, this rifle, this shotgun. I notice you're using it and they want to talk to you. Fine, talk to them. You, you shouldn't be rude to anybody, but you still do need to reset. And so I've had people like, give me just a second. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go down on stage. I'm going to reset targets. Mm -hmm. I'll be right back. And you'll see some of them that'll be like, well, we were having a conversation. Right. Your, your conversation is second to my responsibility to the other people on the range. Right. Yeah. And, and I'll, you'll, I'll even have, happens. you'll have people that actually came to the match to meet you. You know, they're like, oh, well, not it doesn't just happen you, to dudes, the people that they follow. And yeah, they want, they, they deserve your attention and they want your attention. And I want to, I want to meet them. You know, it's very, very cool. Um, but yeah, I know I've done the, I've done the same thing and I'm not perfect every time. And sometimes you'll find yourself standing around and being like, oh crap, I've been standing around for several minutes now, you know, and you're like, oh no, you know, but uh, it, there's nothing wrong with saying, Hey, let me go, uh, let me go, uh, you know, reset real quick and I'll be right back. But uh, you know, you get after you when you're on the range all day long, you do have brain farts. I mean, yeah. you do have moments where you realize you've been stationary for you know five, ten minutes, and maybe you should not have been. But you know, I one of my football with playoff, and and everybody takes a playoff every now and then. We realize that it's the overall work ethic, if you will, throughout the day that comes in. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we're uh, we're resetting stages. We're uh, making sure that we're not talking too much. Uh, we're actually out there helping our squad. We're not letting mom and dad reset or our boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever. What, uh, what else are we supposed to uh, be doing on the, on the stage? Well, so I, I would say the first thing, um, one of the things that's popped in has been social media kind of gives us instant gratification, if you will. Uh, it also gives us an instant place to complain. Um, one of the things that I would say is if for the most part you are, finishing a stage or you watch something happen or something you didn't like going and you know again praising public and uh, scolding private maybe you need to talk to the match director or the range master in private about that mm -hmm. uh, if you're going to social media and hammering on an ro or you don't like these clay throwers or you don't like these long range targets or you don't like these dump barrels whatever it may be going in and publicly making a uh, a post that could potentially see 10,000 people who are going to jump in and have 500 comments about, oh, I hate those two. Number one, uh, you're, you're kind of violating that trust that, yes, you are a customer of that match. If you're a sponsored shooter and your match is paid for, you're not a customer, by the way. Um, so you, you're valid. your complaints are still valid, um, and you should bring them up to the range master and the match director. And for me, as a match director, if you're bringing it up, come over and talk to me, and we'll discuss maybe why those were like that. Um, maybe that's information I can use for next year. That's something I can correct. Uh, and I'm probably going to give you a very favorable response when you go, hey, I noticed that when uh, we put them in the dump barrels, the dump barrels are really loose. And I may go, you know what, we've done everything we can, but it's in a sandy bottom and I can't make them solid. Or I can go, you know what, um, Brian Corey's coming next year now and he's got ways to stake those in the ground that are rock solid. And we've noticed that problem. Thank you for bringing it to me. If you go on to Facebook and say, I'm at match XYZ and the dump barrels on stage four are complete crap, then everybody else starts dogpiling on. I'm probably not going to give you a response. Yeah. And if I do, it's not the one you were looking for. One thing I'll, I would mention, too, is even if you don't say I'm at match XYZ, 300, 300 people know you're there. You know, and if you're yes. like, oh, what do you think about this sort of situation? They know you're there. They know you're there. Oh. And everyone, whether they say they are or not, everyone in their head is making a list all the time. This neighbor doesn't water his lawn when he's supposed to. This neighbor always leaves his trash can outside, right? That's just how humans are. So once you are the dude that complains on Facebook when you don't get your way or when a stage goes poorly, you're always known as the dude who complains on Facebook. Well, and then, and then take take a moment and think about what's the conversation happening on the bay next to you. I mean, yeah. let's, let's say I'm in squad, squad five and you're in squad six. You're, you're one stage ahead of me and you go onto Facebook and bitch up a storm and you're, you're furious about the 500 yard target. You know, there's no way you can tell you can hit it. It's got a strobe light on it. It's not reliable. And you're, you're pissing and moaning like you wouldn't believe. And I'm on stage five. And by the time I get to stage six, where you started, the ROs are all like, guys, hey, if you want, we'll shoot it. We'll show you that the strobe works. Just because the strobe's not going off, that's probably because you're not hitting it. Right. And we're cutting hits as fast as we can. And guess what? The ROs already know that you bitched about it. 
And now I know that you bitched about it. And then when I go to stage seven, they're going like, yeah, the guy who was bitching about the targets on stage six, uh, yeah, he came through here and he was bitching about this too. So we know everything that you've complained about as you progress through the match. And so it's one of those things that, hey, when you go onto Facebook, it's not anonymous. No. You got instant gratification. You got your attention. And guess what? You're getting negative attention the rest of the match too because people knew who it was. And, you know, maybe you bring that up to the match director or the range master and you got two or three people. You got your instant gratification of they're going to make a change. They're going to change this or change that. And then, oh, by the way, nobody else is thinking poorly of you. So it, it unfortunately, social media has given people uh, about three times bigger balls than what they have in real life because they wouldn't say something to your face, but they'll go online and say it. Yeah, that's uh, that's a very good point. And, uh, you know, I, I just don't get it because the uh, like you said, you wouldn't say that in, in, uh, in to someone's face when they find out about it, what if they confront you? What are you going to do then? You know, like always assume that 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 person is going to have a conversation with you, whether it's, uh, you know, an angry or just like a bro. I thought we were bros, you know, that kind of thing. So backpedal is what they do. It, it, it's they, they throw it in reverse and they start backpedaling. And well, it becomes, uh, well, I didn't mean it like that. I wasn't or I wasn't this. meaning to do this. I was just upset. Yeah. Yeah. I was upset. Well, hey, this is the, this is what you get for your actions. Right. Right. Okay. So let's, uh, let's leave, let's leave the, uh, the rants on Facebook out of it. You know, the other thing I would, I would say is like, uh, you might regret it later. You know, you might be PO'd at that point because, you know, you had a bad stage or something. Go and, and talk to the bed of your truck while you're stuffing your magazines and, uh, you know, get it out there. Don't, don't go post it public because, again, you might, you might regret it afterwards. Well, talk, talk to your close personal friends there. You know, typically you talk to your close friend, your friend's like, oh, okay, yeah, they're hearing your story, everything else. And then your friend may look at you and go, dude, you, you're wrong. I was watching it. You were hitting left. You were hitting left. You yeah. were hitting left. You know, the, the, one of the better examples I can give you is one of the first matches that I helped design stages for, there were two brothers who were shooting, and one of the brothers finishes the stage. He unloads. He shows clear, and the RO goes, all right, I've got everything, but I've got one miss past 200 over here on the left. And he starts arguing the call. And the other brother's sitting at the bottom, and he's got this huge grin across his face because it is his brother, and he's about to hammer him. <laughs> and he yells up there, and he goes, you know, I bet your stage time was smoking fast when you skip a target. And, of course, you know, he, his brother hears him, looks down, and goes like, ah, oh, crap. I did miss it. And all of a sudden, all the arguments were gone because here I am. I designed the stages, and I put that one there that you have to remember to shoot that target. It's not hidden, but it's not in a nice straight line with the rest. And he was one of the few guys who missed it. And guess what? He went through. He missed it. And the minute his brother said something, he owned it 100 percent. But his brother said something. And, you know, if he walked off the stage and said something to his brother and barking about this and everything else, his brother would have looked at him and said, yeah, you never shot at it. I was right. standing there. I figure out why you didn't shoot it. So and so a lot of times that anger can go away pretty quick when you talk to somebody. And you don't want to say something, you know, that, yeah, that you're going to want to retract. When yeah. You, yeah. You, you can't. You can't. You know, I, whenever I've got an argument, I, I try to I try to remember that I, I'm probably not 100 percent correct. And if I'm not 100 percent correct, then I can find where I'm incorrect and see it from somebody else's perspective. And, you know, it, and is it really that important? Like, how important is it? Is it something that, um, you know, I need to address because then it will be unfair for other people as well? Or do I just need to go, you know what, because the, I know that I've gotten lucky breaks way more often than I've been nailed for something that wasn't a hundred percent fair. Okay. Um, so you just got to remember that at the, at the end of the day, it, it evens out. Yeah. Maybe that target wasn't quite fair for you, but I know for a fact that, like I said, there've been other targets that went down for me that shouldn't have, or, or, you know, those types of things. So it evens out. So then if you, uh, if you do have like a disagreement like that with, uh, with an RO, how do you handle it? What's the best way to handle that? Perfect question. So if you go through and let's say you have a disagreement with an RO, which is perfectly fine. That happens. Um, have the disagreement with the RO and say, well, you know, I think this. You need to keep your you need to keep your voice in check, keep mm -hmm. your volume in check, keep your language in check, and then go through. And if you disagree with them, ask for the range master or the match director and, and politely and respectfully ask for that. Keep in mind the person who's working that who disagrees with you on it, he disagrees with it because from his perspective, you didn't get that target. You didn't whatever it may be. 
uh, one of the Three Gun Nation matches, I had a disagreement with the RO, and it was over. I, I think actually Karim was videotaping for me. It was whether or not I hit a bonus target with a pistol, and I knew I hit it, and we had video of me hitting it. And when we got to the end, he the 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 range or not the uh, uh, the range officer was there. He goes, "No, you didn't get it." Well, yeah, I did. Well, no, you didn't. Well, okay. Well, we can check the video. And he goes, "Well, I can tell you, you didn't get it." And so we went through. And I go, "Okay, well, I understand. Well, you know, can I look at the video and ask for the range master very respectfully?" And and he said, "Yeah, yeah, we can do that." So he called over the radio, went over, talked to the range master. The range master goes, "Well, you got video of the stage?" He said, "Yes." And I said, and then this is where it's at. This is where I hit it. And, you know, we just had a disagreement whether I hit it or not. And the range master watches the video. He watches it five, six times. He goes, yeah, you hit it. It's not a problem. We'll go ahead and we'll get it corrected. So he came over and he signed off on it. And the thing was, the entire process, I never had to raise my voice. I never had to yell. I never had to use language that was unacceptable. And at the end of it, when the match was over, guess what? Me and that range officer, we were fine. Shook hands, everything else, said, hey, that's how things should be ha handled. And two, three matches later, we're at the Pro in Kentucky, and we're talking about it after shooting that day. He's not a range officer there. He's another shooter. And we were going over like, you know, hey, we think that's how things should be handled at that point. And as if as the match director aspect for me, my job is to be yelled at there. If you want to yell at somebody, yell at me. Don't yell at the range officer. If you're yelling at my range officer, the response from me is not going to be good. You know, if you're polite to the range officer and you're bringing it up to me and we walk off to the side and you and I are having a disagreement, fantastic. We can work through that. You may not get the result you like, but we can still have a conversation. And the range officer is my volunteer. I'm the person who is either being compensated or volunteering to be there ahead of time, you know, and not for a, a you know, shoot the match for free on your worst match performance ever. Yeah. Because nobody as an RO ever shoots their best match, by the way. No. No, that's uh, that's very true, and a lot of times that uh, that RO match is just kind of a check the box thing. Okay, now the real match is starting, so it's uh, it's good to be so cognizant of the that. The stages change a few things and make all the ROs reshoot it because we can't shoot that target there now. Yeah, and so they all have to go spend more of their ammo and their time shooting their poor stages that they shot twenty percent worse than they would. Exactly, and Dylan, something you brought up there um, that I think uh, we need to hammer on a little finer is that ROs are our peers. You know, it's not an us and them. These are our people. These people are volunteering because, you know, one, it's like their home, their hometown match and they want to be like a, a good host or it's just something they do. It helps them shoot more matches. They love the sport so much. They love the people so much. It's it's not for financial gain, for sure. It's it's all oh. out of love. So uh, and that's the reason that we're all doing it. So if we can treat each other with respect, then we will get much, much farther in life as a group well, if you take a good example of that, uh, James Gill was my teammate here a couple weeks ago at the Trigicon 3-Man. Um, we go down to Texas, and I can tell you that it seems like every time in Texas, that guy is one, two, three places ahead of me with one eye and one leg. Yep. And so he, he's always edging me out. Now, I've been to a couple of matches. He's there, and he's ROing. And next thing you know is he's five, ten places behind me. So think about that from the aspect of here's a sponsored shooter, and he's showing up on his his time where he could be at work, his time where he could be making money spends his time at the range, then shows up and is in the heat for the next three days, ROing for you, and then for him doing that, you're going to yell at him. Yeah. Uh, it, it's double time not acceptable, especially if you take a shooter of that caliber and then you're going to start yelling at them about a call on a long-range <laughs> hit. You're not going to argue long-range hits with a guy who will destroy you every time on long-range. Exactly. So... so I, Karin, I go think ahead. real quick, just, you know, it, when you wrap up your stage... Uh, you know, go always go up to the RO and say thank you. You know, gratitude goes a long way. Uh, thank you as they're, you know, getting you set up for the stage. Thank you after the stage brief. Thank you. Just thank you for everything. Just let them know um, because, like, you know, it is it is a hard job. Like I said, I'll RO eventually, you know, but I don't I don't want to be an RO. That that sounds miserable. That's awful, you know. It is. And, uh, and not only that, but but you're the one that everybody's scrutinizing your calls, you know, well, you know, this was messed up. This was messed up. And, and I, you know, I don't want to be that person. So I'm going to be very, very thankful for the person who is that person. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it is, it's, it is tough. I mean, especially when you're talking about, you know, three days, like you just had at the, uh, the shoot for the gold where it's, you know, stinking hot the whole time and you're having to stand out there in the sun and everything like uh, a thank you goes a long way, you know, and uh, uh, ice cream cone goes a little farther, but, 
let's uh, let's just start with the thank you. Well, as long as it's not a Dairy Queen. <laughs> Why is that a reward? Uh, that's a different topic. Anyway, so let's yeah. let's uh, let's move on. So we've we've shot our match. We've been uh, respectful to other shooters. We've been respectful to the uh, the staff, the match staff. We've um, set a good example for juniors and new people by resetting and doing all those uh, those wonderful things. Now, uh, match is over. Where uh, where do we lie on, as far as like shooter etiquette and responsibility once the match is over? So the, the match is over now. A lot depends upon the match that you're at. Uh, at our match, it's you know it's a charity event. We were having people help tear down, and and everybody was fantastic with it. I mean, stages that took two days to build and another day to to basically rebuild in one morning, uh, they were torn down in what an hour. Oh, I mean, it, it, yeah, oh, less. less than an hour. I mean, we had you know 80, 90 people hammer the stages. Boom, done. They're all there. Uh, but a lot of the other matches that we go to, they get torn down Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday after the match, which is fantastic, uh, which means I don't have to do it after three days on the range. Uh, at that point, you know, we've got a few considerations. Sometimes we have meals afterwards. Sometimes we're, we're sharing a beer or something like that. Uh, we've also got the prize table coming up. Um, nobody wants to hear you're complaining about the prize table when you're standing there and by the way, the match sponsors are usually standing there too. Yeah. So if you're standing there and you've got the guy from company XYZ and you're talking about, you know, last year there were four rifles on the table. Now there's only three. And, you know, he's going through like, hey, the market took a downturn after the election and I'm still throwing three rifles on there. Uh, 75% of what I put last year when I've got 50% of my sales. Doesn't really sound like there's much gratitude when he's hearing that. So. No. We want, to, we want to keep those match sponsors. We want to keep them involved in the sport and engaged. So you need to be a little appreciative of what's out there. Uh, and when it comes to the prize table, too, everybody gets a chance to walk it. When it's being set up, stay out of the way. Yeah. Uh, you know, when I went through and I was setting up the prize table for our charity match this weekend, it, you know, somebody wanted to come up and ask a question. It's like, hey, Brian Corey's right outside. Go, go take him your question. He's got range master duties. He's on it. Um, you know, I'm going through and setting up this and moving this, moving things here, trying to make it all fair and equal and equitable. Um, but going through and interrupting with the ROs, you know, tell a couple jokes, make them laugh, something like that, but stay out of their way. Right. Uh, when it comes time to walk, to check out the prize table, move. Mm -hmm. Don't, don't have 30 people standing in one spot looking at the prizes that are ranging from first to 10th. The 30 people are standing there. Bare minimum, 20 of you aren't in consideration for it. Uh, everybody should have a chance to look at what's on the prize table. If, if I'm a sponsor, I want my prizes on the table and visible. Uh, so I want I want everyone to see it, even if the first place guy is taking it and walking away with it, whatever he's doing with it after the match. But I want it visible, and the only way it's visible is if everyone has a chance to see it. So keep everything flowing and moving. You can walk through a second or a third time. Don't stand in one spot and be the traffic jam. Don't be that guy. Yeah, everybody, don't be that guy. Nobody wants to be that <laughs> All right, so the, uh, uh, that's good advice there. And uh, something that I, I don't think I've, I've personally heard, I didn't really have a prize table mentor uh, through, uh, throughout my career here, so thanks for, uh, for sharing that. So once, you, uh, you know, once you're done and packed up, said goodbye to everyone, you're uh, in the truck on the way home, what's your next move? My next move is uh, I have a tendency to send an after action report to the match director and I send it to him privately. Um, the reason being if, if there's something that I saw as an issue or there was an RO that, hey, by the way, this RO was probably a little on the side of being uh, rude to the customer, if you will. Uh, it's kind of the same thing. If I go through and I shop at Walmart and you got a cashier yelling at customers, you know, barking at them, uh, I'm probably going to go through and I'm going to talk to a manager. I'm not going to yell at that cashier there. Uh, I'm going to talk to them, you know, I'm going to talk to the match director and say, hey, by the way, I love the match. Here's what I loved about it. Here are a few things that um, I think would go better off if if it wasn't done this way, which is which is basically what I did with matches in the past to where they made changes to long range targets and making them visible, not hiding them, you know, to where a shadow would cover them at a different part of the day. Uh, but I see no issue with having an after action report sent over to a match director and saying, hey, um, this target, while it's fun to shoot, it was different every time. Or the the star on this stage had old springs on it, and all you had to do was hit one of the plates, and all the rest of them fell off. You, you make a little comment like that, and they go, you know what, you're right. We need to order several different spring packs. 
and make sure that we have those spring packs on hand where when they go down, we have to add them. You know, and, and it's, it's you know, simple things. A lot of times they can't be there for 300 shooters to watch one Texas star. So they may not even know that. So, I mean, yeah, that's, and if that's, it wasn't communicating it with them because the RO is handling their stage, which yeah. a good RO, I shouldn't have to come to your stage if I'm the match director. Right. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, other than an AD or a 180 violation, whatever it may be, which, you know, somebody like Brian Corey designs it and it's pretty hard to break 180 because of how the targets are presented. Uh, but I shouldn't have to come to your stage. I should come to your stage and say hi and make sure you got enough water, everybody's staying hydrated and healthy, and make sure everybody's happy and on time. Uh, if I'm coming to your stage to fix targets and I'm discovering it when I get there, it's because you didn't say something you probably should have. Uh, but, yeah, it, as a match director, I had eight stages over a day and a half. I tried to make myself visible as many of as, as many of those, of those stages as possible, as often as possible, but I don't get to see that target shot every single time. Right. Right. Okay. So you've uh, you've you know sent off uh, uh, an email to the uh, match director with your after action report. What's next? <coughs> I think every match I've ever been to on the prize table, the match director asks that the shooters thank the sponsor companies for sponsoring the match. And it, you hear it so often that if you kind of stop registering it. Um, but being on the team that's dr that is approaching companies and asking to please sponsor the match, and especially when you find the one you know the ones that are so generous that maybe not maybe they don't just send their products, which is great, but maybe they show up too and they're there yeah. with you or they help build the stages. We we can have a match without sponsors, but it makes it that much special. It makes it it, it attracts the shooters to come, and it, it's just a great way to end. Maybe they're maybe they're donating actually money to your cause, or maybe it's the products for the shooters, um, or maybe it's the targets you're shooting, or maybe it's the targets yeah, that you're shooting. Absolutely. You know, but we but if you all that it takes is maybe a, a Facebook post or a Facebook message or an email that just says, "Hey, I noticed that you were one of the sponsors at this match that I went to. I picked this stuff off the prize table. Thank you for sponsoring that match." Because the next year, when the same you know match directors approach them again, these companies will remember. Oh yeah, you know people actually. I do remember some response. They may not remember mm -hmm. exactly who it was that said something or how, or what they said. I mean, as long as it was positive. Um, but they'll go. Oh yeah, no, that actually was a success. We we were noticed at that match because it is marketing for them as well. It's yeah. marketing. Um, is it? Are they getting a return on their investment? Are they creating customers or um, repeat customers for you know? putting these products out uh, into the market to to the people that would be their customers. I mean, is it working for them? Because if it's not working for them, they well, they move, on. they move on. They'll exactly. try something else. We, we had a conversation about it at the end of, uh, at the end of our match uh, before the prize table, and, and Corinne had an idea. Basically, we had the shooters go through. When you grab your prize, take a picture of it, have make your a social phone media post, too. and tag them. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, pick it up, turn around, have your buddy snap a picture real quick. It takes two seconds. Walk off, post it, tag them, everything else, which works great. Which you know, I, I had a, uh, I had one of the parents of a junior shooter come up to me, and we were talking about you know kind of how we do things, and she goes, you know, she sits down and she writes out physically writes out handwritten letters to the sponsors, which I think is great. Wow, yeah, because because keep in mind there's a there's a private aspect and there's a public aspect. Um, I don't think emails work anymore. But let's face it, every one of these sponsors goes through, mm -hmm. and they get an email every 30 seconds of somebody asking for something. Mm -hmm. And they're going to go through and they're going to get several thank you emails and they're going to get open and they're going to get a cut and paste response and they're probably not going to remember that at all. But if you go through and you send them a postcard that says, you know, I really appreciate you guys supporting this cause and this sport and it was fantastic. I had a great time. Whether they took anything off the price table or not and they sign it, that, that's a very personal touch. Um, marketing wise, they probably don't get anything from it, but at least they remember it. So, on the marketing aspect, if we go through and we have an Instagram post or we have a Facebook post or something on Twitter or something like that that they're seeing and they're tagged in it, well, guess what? You've, you've got a little bit on that personal front, uh, probably not quite as personal as the written letter, but they actually have people seeing it because anybody who follows you sees it. Anyone who shares it, it it's kind of one of those compounding things. Yeah. If Corinne shares it, then I share hers and somebody shares mine and shares hers. That person you know, gets everything fourfold at that point. Right. Well, um, I'm glad you guys brought that up. And I'd like to uh, read just a, a few texts that I, um, a little conversation I had with a uh, 
a top shooter, and uh, I didn't ask him if I could do this, so I won't say his name, but um, I asked, uh, how do you prefer to show gratitude for uh, for the prize table, email, Facebook, post, etc.? And uh, he said, uh, I like Facebook because it's public and others see it, so it's already advertising for them. As e- An email is way better than nothing but less exposure. Uh, and I never buy anything from a company unless they support a match somewhere sometime. Uh, and then I followed up with, uh, how do you feel about thanking a company publicly that directly competes with a personal sponsor of yours. Um, and then he said, uh, I do it at every match. Uh, if a sponsor ever had an issue with, with uh, this, I would end up in my relationship with them immediately. They, the continued support for this sport is priority number one and obviously beneficial to any sponsor of mine. If they are short-sighted and petty t- to, not see, to not see that, then I don't want anything to do with them. So Exactly. You know, we were at the Trigicon, three-man, three-gun here two weeks ago. <laughs> My sponsor is Vortex. Okay. Yes. Um, I, I'm talking to Ruben from Vortex at the airport while sitting at the airport bar with uh, with Matt Martini drinking whatever fruity drink I had at the time that he was making fun of me for. <laughs> um, but we're talking about it, and he's like, oh, what prize did you get? And he's like, you know, all that stuff. Never once did the complaint pop up that, like, well, hey, man, you know, you tagged Trigicon in, like, four different posts in there. It, there was there was no complaint. There was no pettiness. It was like, hey, yeah. they supported a match. It was a great match. We're happy for you, blah, blah, blah. And it was more of a, a conversation of like, hey, you were at the match and representing us well. It doesn't matter who the other sponsor was. And, and if we really start to think about it and we talk about what companies are commonly used in this sport, I would argue there aren't very many of them who aren't supporting it in some form. If you want to say STI doesn't support a particular match, I can hand off God knows how many shooters that are directly sponsored by them. That is still supporting the sport. Yes. If you want to look at rifle manufacturers, a lot of them are supporting it in some fashion. So I don't have a problem going and ordering, you know, uh, such and such set of trigger pin or lower parts kits. You know, I'm not going to go like, wow, you know, this company's local and they do this here, everything else, but they don't support three gun. Well, no. There are three shooters that they're sponsoring those shooters, and they also sponsored this match. So I, I have absolutely no issue whatsoever uh, tagging and representing a company that does not sponsor me when they supported that match because there are a lot of them that have been direct competition yeah. with my sponsors, and it's a definite I am going to thank them as publicly as possible. And I've heard it the the uh, other way too. Well, if, you know, they're not you know directly supporting you, so we'll- – you know, why are you giving them that free exposure? And uh, I just don't agree with that. And It wasn't free. That's not free exposure. Yeah, exactly. They, they sponsored the match. It's no longer free at that point. I, I am totally with you on that point. Totally with uh, yeah. you. And I, was, I completely agree the with the, uh, the shooter that I was talking to as well. It's like, uh, you know, support the, the people that support us for sure. Yeah. Whether they're supporting you directly or not. Right. They're, they're supporting someone somewhere, you know, like uh, – Good buddy Jay Carrillo was staying with us for the shoot for the gold match, and Trigicon sponsored shooter is you know staying in my house. It's like you know I'm not kicking him out because he's sponsored by a competitor. But the backyard though, right? Yeah, I mean it's <laughs> good dude. He's yeah, yeah. He had to stay in a tent in 100 degree weather. But I mean, other than that, I mean you know I, I did give him an extension cord for his fan, so, <laughs> which he does. Which but, he travels to each stage. Yeah, with. yeah he, he did travel with a fan on nice. every stage. So uh, I think he may have figured something out though. Jay's like the uh, the three gun Boy Scout. He is always prepared. Yeah, he he. Uh, you ought to see the kit that he travels with in his truck. You you'd understand really quick. It's like wow, um, I don't have any of that. Yeah, I was hanging Maybe with him at, at the uh, Trigun, and you know he had like a nice, uh, um, you know, canopy and stuff like that. But so um, so we've we've talked about before. We've talked about during. We've talked about after the match. Is there anything as far as like shooter etiquette? how to be a good squad mate, how to be a good shooter and in, a in, uh, good person in general that you guys feel like we haven't covered that you want to get out there. Don't put the sport above the people. Don't put your performance above your relationship with other shooters. That's what I would say. Can you expand if, on that a little bit? Nothing else, just let you act. Just pretend that your mom's watching you the whole time. Mm-hmm. There you and, go. and if your mom, if your mom's not a good person, think of it as somebody else's mom who you would think is a good person. that's <laughs> watching you. So you're you're wanting to make a good impression. You're you're wanting somebody to remember that hey, you know this this was a good person. This was a good man, woman, whatever, uh, hardworking person, everything else. You don't want to be remembered as like well, you know, Tinter Tantrum Sally is over there throwing a 
throwing another toddler fest. And, you know, we, we don't want to be remembered as that. You want to be remembered as somebody who put in the time, you did things right. You know, even if you're a, let, let's say you have a jersey, you don't have a jersey. I don't want to look over and see like, well, yeah, everybody reset except for this person. Yeah. Uh, the only other thing that I can think of as far as etiquette, and, it, and it's kind of a, a loose rule, um, I typically try not to take anything of my sponsor stuff from the table if I can avoid it. Mm. So when the prize table comes around, if I win first place and the best thing on the table is for my sponsor, unless there's a big disparaging value or something like that, I'm probably going to avoid it. I want somebody else to experience what I'm experiencing to enjoy what I'm enjoying, uh, and I'm probably going to move it on to the next person. Uh, besides that, though, no, just just have everybody remember you overall as a, as a good person, you'll be fine. Yeah, and um, people are not going to remember how you shot, but they will remember how you behaved. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, uh, that's a very good point. So the uh, Colorado Three-Gun Championship that we just had a couple weeks ago, um, you know, I was uh, hosting a shotgun side stage, and uh, – you know, so I got to be a part of the uh, the RO chatter that, you know, shooters usually aren't a part of. And uh, there were several groups of people that they were like, this guy was, am-, you know, these guys, I guess, this team, amazing resetters. These teams, this team was completely on it and this and that. So there's uh, there's not just the bad part of it, like you'll be remembered as a, as a poor resetter. You can be remembered as someone who's on it and someone who, like, shoot, if, if I'm ever at a match, I would love to squad with that guy because they're, you know, good shooter, good person, and and a great resetter. Yeah. yeah I'd say it's spot on. When I, w- when I was in RO, that was one of the things that I noticed. Uh, a couple of shooters that showed up, they had the Army Marksmanship Unit came through, and we sat there, and, you know, one of my first matches that I was in RO at, they came to the stage. It's like, man, these guys are, these guys are all business. Then the, the minute that the stage starts – they reset as hard or harder than anyone else. And then the minute they were done shooting, it was back to joking and laughing with squad mates. I mean, they were, they were very professional on every front. Uh, then you go through and you squad with some of the guys from the Minnesota three gun group. Uh, those nut jobs are sprinting to, to who's going to get to the farthest target, you know, who can get there first. And, you know, they've got pasters on their fingers sprinting, trying to dive into the target to see if you can get it. And, I mean, it, it's, it's almost comical to watch them, but the work ethic is, is very high and it's something that's extremely memorable at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, Dylan, Corinne, this uh, this has been a great conversation, and uh, I feel like I should have had this uh, conversation like a year and a half ago somewhere early in the uh, shows, but I'm glad that we're doing it now and uh, getting the good information out there for, for people, and hopefully everyone can, t- uh, you know, take it to heart and and uh, and learn from it. Yeah, and hopefully in a positive light. Yeah. yeah. If, you, if you feel like you've been called out, it's probably because you haven't been called out. Uh, it's probably because that you're feeling a little guilty about something you've done. Yeah, there's yeah. the definitely the guilty thing conscience thing. Every every bad thing we're talking about, I've done before, and I want people to call me out if I do it again. Privately, I probably and probably worse. Oh, he's definitely worse, but <laughs> we just expect worse of him. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, I I definitely appreciate your time, and uh, Dylan, thanks for bringing up this uh, this great conversation, and Corinne, thank you for being here. And uh, and participating with us, this has been uh, a ton of fun. I appreciate both of your point of view on this uh, topic, and thank you so much for being on the Three Gun Show. Happy to. Thanks, Dave. Hey, before you take off, check out the show notes at threegunshow.com slash episode 147 for links to things that we discussed in the podcast and to sign up for Patreon as a Three Gun Show supporter or to purchase your very own Three Gun Show logo tee. I'll also have links to the other podcasts that uh, Corinne and Dylan have been on Uh, on the show. So check those out as well. As always, this podcast is brought to you by Armalite. Armalite likes the community that we are building here at the three gun show. And we have partnered up for 2017 to be sure that it is a win for you as well. Armalite has allowed me to get special pricing for listeners on their line of three gun rifles, both the 13 and a half and the 18 inch, as well as their competition handguards, gas blocks and tunable muzzle brakes. I just got a new shipment of muzzle brakes in as well. Um, The last ones went really fast, but uh, I'm totally resupplied, so good to go there. If you're in the market for a rifle or components to build your own, email me, dave at 3 and I will hook you up. I'm back on the road now, traveling the country, and bringing the good times back to you in podcast form. I will have all of this Armalite gear with me at matches for you to check out, so when you see me at a match, just ask, and I'll be happy to show you. You can even shoot mine if you like. 
And a little bonus, like I said earlier, I'll be hanging out with Jeremy Gresham of SAC at the Armalite and Nexus booth at, at Rock Castle Pro-Am. So come and say, hey. And uh, you know what? Like I said, I heard there may be some deals there as well. A quick reminder that if you enjoyed this episode of the podcast, subscribe on iTunes, Google Play, Podcast Addict, or wherever you get your podcast content so you will always get the very latest. Thank you so much for downloading, listening, and subscribing to the show. I'm Dave Harmon, and I'll see you on the range. Unload show clear.